my name, let me introduce myself, is Matthew Sussex, and I'm the Academic Director here at the National Security College. And uh, I know that I speak for all of my colleagues here tonight when I say that we're both delighted uh, and also honoured to host the Foreign Minister of Poland, Witold Waszczykowski, tonight. And I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Ngunnawal people, the traditional custodians of the land that we're meeting on today, and to pay my respects to their elders, past and present. Now, ladies and gentlemen, shortly I will introduce the Vice-Chancellor, Professor Brian Schmidt, to formally welcome the Minister and to invite him to give his address. But before I do so, it's probably worth going over some housekeeping uh, that uh, Minister Vaschikowski will speak, speak for about 20, 25, 30 minutes, well, as long as he likes, really. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but he's indicated also that he's happy to take questions after he finishes. Uh, but he does have to leave very promptly uh, at uh, 5.10, I think, 5.15. So uh, please, if you do have questions, we welcome them, uh, but keep them as succinct, succinct as possible. Uh, I should also uh, thank in advance uh, Ambassador Pavel Milevsky uh, and also his Deputy Head of Mission Piotr Bushta uh, for both their generosity and their very hard work in, to, in helping Mass uh, arrange this event uh, and also of course to our own Chris Farnham from the NSC for making it a reality. Uh, also I'd like to acknowledge and welcome the distinguished visitors who are in the Minister's travelling party. Uh, Jan Paris, Head of the Minister's Political Cabinet, Cesare Lushinsky, his Chief of Staff, Michal Kolodzieski, head of the Asia-Pacific Department, Barbara Cvioro, head of the European Policy Department, Mace Falkowski, uh, deputy head of the Department of Economic Cooperate, uh, Cooperation, and Swavomi Mashluk, policy officer from the Asia-Pacific Department. Thank you to all of you for coming uh, and welcome to the ANU. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me really great pleasure to introduce the Vice-Chancellor of the ANU, Professor Brian Schmidt. Uh, Professor, Professor Schmidt, of course, uh, has been known to many of us before he took up the Vice-Chancellor's position at the ANU in 2016. Uh, he is, of course, one of the world's leading astrophysicists. He has a master's degree and a PhD degree from Harvard University. He's a fellow of the Australian Academy of Science, the United States Academy of Science, and the Royal Society. Uh, Brian was made a companion of the Order of Australia in 2013, and just along the way, he also managed to pick up the Nobel Prize for Physics in 2011. Okay. So we are once again very honoured to have him here with us tonight at the National Security College. And I now invite Professor Schmidt to the stage to introduce the Minister, Vice-Chancellor. Ladies and gentlemen, it's great to see so many people here today. Uh, to our many uh, members of the diplomatic corps, and uh, to the delegation from Poland. Thank you all for coming along tonight. Poland and Australia have a unique relationship underpinned by a large and vibrant Polish community living across our country. In the decade after World War II, the Polish-born population in Australia grew from just over around 6,000 people to more than 56,000. A further 15,000 Poles immigrated to Australia in the 1950s and 1960s. And then from the 1980s until the collapse of communism in Eastern Europe, another 25,000 Pol Polish people were granted entry, entry, entry to Australia, many as refugees. As its political and economic situation has improved, many people have returned to Poland, but our nation remains enlivened by the nearly 50,000 people of Polish extraction who continue to call Australia their home. Poland's influence in Australia can be seen across some of our most famous landmarks. Mount Kosciuszko, which whose name I think we butcher, uh, is only a few hours drive from here, 7,300 feet, uh, uh, one of the, the tallest mountain in Australia. And one of our famous exporters, uh, Pavel Strzelecki, is just another name that we're familiar with. We also find Polish flavor in our cultural and sporting icons, from Magda Subanski to Michael Klim and Daniel Kowalski, uh, swimmers here in Canberra that we would all know, uh, all who claim Polish heritage. In the last 20 years, our bilateral trading relationship has grown well, especially in the resources and mining sectors. 
Australian investment in Poland has grown close to a billion Australian dollars, and many of our leading companies, for example, the Macquarie Group and Amcor among them, are active in Poland. But it's the realm of security that Australians perhaps have the most to learn from our friends in Poland. Its location as a geopolitical pivot point between two historically major powers has taught Poland some harsh lessons about security. Today, Poland again faces significant security challenges in its immediate region, from old challenges of power politics to new ones such as cybersecurity and migration. In many ways, it is a testament to the resilience of the Polish people that their nation has not just endured a tumultuous history, but also is thriving in the process. And it's with that spirit that I welcome Dr. Witold um, Waszukowski, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Poland, to address us. And I was just saying he has chosen a very interesting time to be foreign uh, minister in Poland. With that, please come to the stage. Thank you, Minister. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished members of uh, the university, students, distinguished guests, uh, it's uh, both a great uh, honor and privilege to address one of the finest uh, higher education institutions in Australia, an institution which, uh, with a rich history and great uh, heritage, where the torch of knowledge, let me say this, has been passed to new generations for many decades. We need to acknowledge that in uh, recent years, our world has entered a period of turbulence, a period of uncertainty. And you're right, I'm a chosen the minister in such a period. A period in which the most fundamental tenets of our civilization, which, which some of us may have taken for granted, are being called into questions. It goes without saying that the unprecedented challenges we are now facing require concerted leadership of governments, politicians, public opinion leaders, civil society, and the media. In this context, the Australian National University and the National Security College are essential building blocks of expanding knowledge of and public awareness about daunting challenges of our time. When we uh, emphasize that this is a period of uncertainty, uh, we have to remind ourselves that uh, a long time ago, we already forgot about the notion of end of history, peaceful dividend, or strategic pause. So with this in mind, I do wish to emphasize that this is an excellent opportunity to share with you my country's perspective on the most pressing challenges facing our security. Looking at the map of the world, you immediately notice that Poland and Australia are almost half the world away. Some of you may agree that the sheer distance between us renders our perspectives on these issues quite different. And yet, the truth is that we have, to, we have a lot uh, more in common that one may think at first glance. Uh, let me start with the obvious. Our countries are both the proud members of the Western civilization. And maybe it's not politically correct say, to say this, but also the Christian civilization. And I have to emphasize, as a Poles coming from the uh, country of uh, John Paul II. We are both active contributors to the Western world order, which we have built together with other nations. And both Poland and Australia are strong democracies with democratic ideals and institutions. Democratic values are the cornerstone of our freedom, forming the foundation of our vibrant economies, prosperity, and liberty of our citizens. However, we need to acknowledge that these values and freedoms are not given once and for all, and that sometimes they require ultimate sacrifices in their defense. We all remember the great Australian contribution to the First and Second World War. We all remember that Polish and Australian soldiers fought shoulder to shoulder 
in Tobruk, today's Libya, during the Second World War, in the name of values that cherished freedom and democracy. Today, amid turbulent times, securing freedom, prosperity, and liberty remains as valid as a challenge as it, is, as it was before and should remain the top priority of our governments. Poland, like Australia, is a close ally of the United States with strong bilateral, multilateral, political, economic, and security ties. Since 1999, we have been a member of NATO, of which, of which uh, Australia is an important partner, and, mem and a member of the European Union since 2004. Let me remind you also that we, we are a member of NATO, a member of the European Union, because of the struggle of Solidarity Trade Union in the 1980s. The work we undertake to defend our values throughout our regions and beyond is an important one. In Asia, we are witnessing dangerous tendencies where power politics, the use of military force, and disregard for international law become more and more apparent. Recently, we have witnessed yet another ballistic, ballistic missile test by, by, by an unpredictable North Korea, which undermines regional and global stability by violating international law. Lingering maritime disputes between nations in the South China Sea pose a direct threat to freedom of navigation and global prosperity as most of global trade passes through waters encompassing this region. In Europe, we have witnessed uh, similar tendencies in the past couple of years. We have bore witnesses with, to the violation of the basic uh, foundations of the international order established at the end of the Cold War. For the first time since the end of the Second World War, a major power, a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council, used force against a smaller nation, taking its territory, instigating internal unrest, violence, and military aggression that continues to this day. In the coming years, we'll have to deal with uh, predictable Imperial Russia, which, as we speak, develops an extensive, complex network of capabilities, both hybrid and conventional, building up modern military forces at our doorstep, in Kaliningrad, around the Baltic, in the Arctic, in Black Sea, and the Mediterranean. A power which deliberately conducts announced, un announced military maneuvers and which includes nuclear strike scenarios against our cities and its military exercises. A power which is ready and willing to undermine the basic laws, norms and values which guide international relations. This is the reality we are facing in Europe today. As these dangerous trends continue, it is becoming more evident that ensuring maritime and aviation security in our region, around the Baltic Sea and beyond, much as in Asia, is an ever-growing priority. In the last couple of years, the number of dangerous incidents involving military air aircraft and sea vessels has increased dramatically. These incidents bring danger not only to our men and women in uniform, but also to ordinary citizens who travel on a daily basis. They also contribute to growing instability, increasing the risk of conflict that may be caused by misperception, miscalculation, or the simplest of mistakes. The annexation of Crimea and Russian aggression in eastern Ukraine about a symptom of the challenges to our security to our democratic institutions, and to our values of free people. Whether we look at the north, the east, or the south of Europe, 
these challenges are there. It seems they will be with us for a long time, and therefore we need to act to address them in the most adequate way possible. Looking in another direction, we also see that Europe's security faces a number of threats stemming from growing instability in the Middle East and North Africa, where unrest, radical ideology and fragile states deprive ordinary people of their basic political rights, leave entire population without proper conditions of living, pulling away the whole generation of young people from the opportunities offered by education and a stable, safe environment. In recent days, yet again, we have witnessed one of the most barbaric acts on violence in Syria, with the use of chemical weapons against innocent civilians. The instability and protracted conflicts affect and will continue to affect Europe in a very direct way. We have seen unprecedented, unprecedented numbers of migrants fleeing war, persecution, or lack of economic opportunities in their home countries. We have seen a growing number of deadly attacks against our people, most recently in London, Stockholm, Dortmund, Paris, Nice, Berlin, Brussels. Regardless of the country, community of people they target, ter terrorists seek to spread fear. Their aim is to divide us, to undermine public trust in governments, ability to provide their citizens with the basic security and tools to prosper. But most importantly, terrorists want to challenge and ultimately destroy our way of life. So what can we do as nations, as democracies, as vibrant economies, and as a members of the same Western civilization to address these challenges? The short answer is, we need to do everything in our power to preserve and restore the order we have worked so hard to build. The Western world as a whole, regardless of differing priorities, perspectives or sheer geographic distance between nations, must protect in institutions, basic norms and values. We must do more to reinforce our alliances, expand cooperation and challenge the actions that stand against the values we cherish, so as not to pay a much higher price later. And to this end, Poland has worked rel relentlessly the, to strengthen basic foundations of European security, which is NATO and European Union. Last year, for the first time in 17 years of our NATO membership, Warsaw gathered the Allied leaders and, uh, and NATO global partners at a historic summit, which laid ground for the long-term adaptation of the most powerful uh, alliance of the world. Our priority remains to make sure that Poland and the countries of our region and the alliance as a whole are most secure through the implementation of the decisions we made in Warsaw. We will continue to highlight the importance of transatlantic relations and the role of the United States has in bringing security and stability to Europe and beyond. Last month, we welcomed the contributions of the United States, the United Kingdom and Romania, who formed a multinational battle group as a part of NATO forward presence in Poland and the Baltic States. For Poland and our allies, it is an important event as NATO troops are deployed here in the region for the very first time in history. As a nation, which is both a host of Allied troops and a contributor of forces to the battle group in Latvia, we want NATO forces to secure our region as long as a threat to our security continues. In light of uh, decisions we made at the Warsaw Summit, Poland will continue to advocate a realistic approach to challenges posed by Russia. I would like to be clear, this approach does not exclude dialogue. As we have said time and again, the dialogue should be conducted, but it should be based on respect of international norms, 
values and should be held in a good faith. Let us face these facts. This is not an impossible task. This is not impossible to meet these pr principles if you are generally willing to reduce tensions, restore mutual trust and stability. In order to secure our region, we also support and ascribe to NATO expanding cooperation with partners in, it, in its immediate neighborhood and throughout the world. Australia has been an excellent example uh, in this regard. I would like to commend your country for your long-lasting engagement in global security and welcome your contribution to NATO missions in Afghanistan and the Alliance Cooperation Programs. We hope that uh, our joint efforts remain as dynamic as ever, bringing stability to your region and the transatlantic area. It is our firm belief that in order to respond effectively to challenges facing security within the and beyond Europe, the European Union must play a more active role. At the moment, our community is facing another important challenge, that is Brexit. We respect the decision made by the British people. At the same time, we would like the United Kingdom to remain engaged in the security affairs concerning our region, as it is voiced by, this voice has always been important, whether in NATO or the European Union, and will continue to be so. Despite these diverse challenges, it is important to remember that the European Union holds a unique set of effective instruments. From trade and economic measures, through development aid, to civilian capabilities that are essential to dealing with societies married by instability. We believe that the European Union's common security and defense policy should be developed further to be able to respond effectively to novel threats such as hybrid warfare, cyber warfare, and terrorism. This is also why we believe that bringing proper synergy to the unique capabilities of NATO and the European Union is so important. We have begun to strengthen the European Union NATO cooperation in Warsaw, in Warsaw during the Warsaw Summit, through a joint declaration signed during the summit, and we pursue this major goal. To address regional challenges caused by war, unrest, and terrorism, Poland advocates focusing on means aimed at reducing migratory pressures, protecting our external borders. But above all, we believe that we should find ways to address the root causes of the migration, rather than deal with them only when the consequences are too hard to bear. We should find proper levels, the common areas of cooperation, and invest in them in order to develop effective tools of work with countries of migrants' origin and transit ones. We should reach out to states that are regional leaders, facilitating the establishment of robust centers of growth in the long term as well as labor markets that provide opportunities. We should place development cooperation and humanitarian aid as a key component of our efforts. Poland remains active in helping countries in need on a bilateral basis. We are present in Lebanon, Jordan, and Iraq, where we bring aid to refugees fleeing from Syria. As terrorists remains one of the most important threats to Western societies, we believe that only a truly global, concerted effort can bring long-lasting security. Poland and the countries of our region are less threatened by terrorist attacks but we firmly believe in solidarity and therefore we refuse to stand by. We recognize that the main source of current terrorist threats comes from Daesh. Hence, together with Australia and other countries, we have actively engaged in efforts of the global coalition against Daesh. Our aircraft is conducing reconnaissance flights 
why are our military is providing vital training to Iraqi security forces. Furthermore, we support our partners in international organizations such as the United Nations, the European Union, the OSC, where we are actively engaged in initiatives and aim at combating terrorism. These efforts, which uh, both Poland and Australia have supported, have measurable effects as Daesh remains on the defense losing territory it once captured, as we speak. The, rec the recent tragic events in Syria highlight the importance of global security institutions, such as the United Nations. Poland is commonly committed, member of the United Nations and a signatory of a non-proliferation regimes, for instance, the chemical weapons conventions. We are also an active member of the Organization for the Prohibition of the Chemical Weapons. Each year, in the first committee of the UN General Assembly, Poland sponsors resolutions aimed at a broader implementation of the Convention. We would like to offer our perspective and experience to our partners while solving together global security problems. This is why we are currently seeking a non-permanent seat in the UN Security Council for the term 2018-2019. We want the European Union to be stronger, uh, and the United Nations also to be stronger, sorry. Uh, still my mind is fixed on European Union, which is uh, under such a pressure of Brexit and other problems. So we want the United Nations to be stronger and its underlying laws and norms to be respected. If Poland is elected to the UN Security Council, our, our priorities and actions will be directly connected to the vision of the current global geopolitical dynamics that I have just outlined. We will join the Secretary General and uh, current members of the Council in their efforts to enhance the role of the UN Security Council as a major actor in a, pre in a preventive diplomacy. We will also include the fight against terrorists and the UN peacekeeping operations among our topmost priorities. <coughs> Together with the other members, we will actively seek the resolution of conflict in the Middle East and other affected regions. And this brings me to the point. I believe that the only way to be heard and listened is to speak your mind both at the right time, time and the right place. We would like to use this unique opportunity, this unique two years in the Security Council to show our perspective, use our experience, and contribute creatively to its work and to the global peace and security. We are eager to provide a counterbalance to the vision of the world that, uh, that is dom that dominating powers and times try to impose by it in Ukraine, in Syria, or in another place in the world. We will stress the importance of the rule of law and respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity. Our activity and engagement cannot and will not be only a matter of words. Poland has been present in UN peacekeeping missions since 1953. In the 1990s, we were on the main, we were one of the main troop contributing countries we participating in missions in the Middle East, Lebanon, Syria, Egypt, in Africa, Western Balkans. Currently, Poland uh, seconds military and police observers to the UN peacekeeping operations. Within forthcoming months, we plan to enlarge our contribution to these operations. Moreover, in our efforts to repay a particular attention to implementation of the UN agenda on women, peace and security. Indeed, the role of women in addressing parties and vulnerable victims of conflicts, especially 
other women and children is often irreplaceable. This is the record we bring to this table and the principles we will espouse. Ladies and gentlemen, last uh, September, President of Poland, Andrzej Duda, in his speech to the UN General Assembly, invoked one of the ancient Roman principles. The law is not born from lawlessness. As democracies, members of the Western civilization, close allies of the United States, and most of all, people truly committed to freedom, wherever we stand, whoever we speak to, and despite different challenges, different interests and perspective on the security of our immediate neighbors, first and foremost, we should be mindful of what binds us together. We need to be relentless in advocating, res advocating respect uh, for international law and the rules which prevented a global war in the last couple of decades. We must continue to reject politics of force, politics of aggression, as well as politics of fear. We have no other viable choice. Our security, the security of our institutions and prosperity of our people demand and depend on our resolve in responding to these challenges in this week, months and the years ahead. I thank you for the this week and now, as I promised, I'll be happy to answer some questions or maybe exchange debate on some of these issues I just mentioned. Excellency, thank you very much. Uh, Professor John Blackson from the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre, a uh, close colleague of uh, Matthew, Professor Matthew Sussex here at the National Security College. Thank you for coming to Australia. Thank you for your remarks. Thank you for your expression of solidarity. Uh, it's uh, very interesting to hear what you have to say about the challenges from Poland's perspective, from the other side of the globe, that seem to certainly echo the challenges we are facing on this side of the globe. I wonder if you have something to say about the challenges we face uh, in uh, particularly uh, at the moment over North Korea uh, and uh, in terms of expressing solidarity in the face of other challenges in East Asia, Southeast Asia, we know Britain and France have sent aircraft and ships to uh, train and exercise alongside Japan and the United States. Uh, are we likely to see Poland reach out this way as well? Thank you. And we can contribute to this effort because uh, as a, uh, one of the few countries, uh, we have a Polish embassy in Pyongyang and North Korea has a Pol embassy in Poland. So we can uh, contribute using our diplomatic skills because before you start uh, shooting and shelling North Korea, I think that we're supposed to try diplomacy. We will not be able to destroy all the military sites of North Koreans. Uh, so it's better to start talking to them first uh, before we start uh, shooting. We also are supposed to uh, look at the example of other countries who used to have a, a nuclear arsenal and uh, was promised, uh, were promised to, to be protected by the national community and now a target of aggression. I mean Ukraine. If we solve the Ukrainian case, which uh, 25 years ago decided to get rid of nuclear weapons and instead of uh, nuclear weapon got the declaration signed by the United States, United Kingdom and Russia that uh, without nuclear weapon, security of uh, Ukraine is protected by this declaration. And now this pledge, this promise is violated. 
So how we can convince the other countries which are developing nuclear programs like Korea, like Iran, that they are safe and secure? So I think although we are located in a different places in Europe and the world, uh, some of the issues, the security issues in our regions are connected. If we solve the problem of Ukraine, we can probably advance in solving the problem of nuclear weapons in Korea and Iran. More questions, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, sir. Can you come here? The mic is coming. Oh. Thank you for your remarks. I am Leszek Puszynski from the National Security College. And it seems as though Poland will, will not be able to escape the Russian embrace. It's a continual refrain in, in Polish history. I would like to know from you, what is, your, what is Poland's relationship with uh, the Ukraine at the moment? And what are the possibilities of the Ukraine uh, joining NATO? And also, what about your relationship with Belarus and the Baltic states? And uh, would it be possible for you to, for Poland to develop a closer relationship, relationship with those, particularly Ukraine and the Baltic states, which have similar fears about Russia? And we are talking about uh, two different groups of countries. The Baltic countries, I mean, Lithuania, Latvia, Latvia and uh, Estonia, a part of NATO, a part of the European Union. The security of these countries is protected by the national uh, law, by uh, Washington Treaty, and by deployment of uh, troops by last decision of NATO summit. I just mentioned about this. Uh, there is a different situation in Ukraine and Belarus. And there is a different situation between those two countries. Uh, Ukraine is a uh, is a target of uh, aggression right, right now, the Moscow aggression. Uh, Belarus is a, is a country which is trying to survive with a close cooperation with, uh, with Russia. It's uh, accepting the large military exercise, Russian military exercise in the territory of, of Belarus. Last year, we tried to approach uh, Belarus because there were signs of uh, toll, with uh, signs of openness. We try to use this uh, uh, opportunity to uh, to give uh, Belarus alternative that uh, I, uh, I, there is uh, other option not only to cooperate with Russia, not to only to be subordinate to, to Russia. We will see. So far, Belarus acted cautiously uh, and with suspicions. Uh, we are patient and we will keep this alternative open, provided there is no. Uh, there is no, uh, there is no fight with uh, democratic, uh, democratic uh, institutions or democratic society. Uh, so that's about uh, Belarus. About Ukraine, well, a few years ago, two countries uh, in Europe, France and Germany, decided to formulate uh, norm Normandy format and promise and pledge to solve this conflict so far unsuccessfully. So I think that uh, Minsk agreement is, not, is never going to be implemented. Uh, we have to think about the new format, new formula of solving the crisis of the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. Poland is open and cooperative to Ukraine. Last year we issued more than 1,200,000 visas, half uh, visas which were issued by Europe, were issued by Poland. And half of these visas issued by us 650,000 were with the work permit. So, what else we can we can uh, do? How how in what way we can we can help uh, Ukraine to survive this tragic situation, this tragic uh, aggression? They are generating working in Poland, generating up to five billion euro per year, sending back to Ukraine to support Ukrainian economy and of course their families. Thank you for the presentation. I'm Paul from Public Pol uh, Policy. Uh, I've got two questions. What's the, in your own view, what's the role of international criminal court in terms of solving the Syria crisis? 
the second question is about the humanitarian support towards refugees, especially in Africa, whereby the humanitarian aid has reduced. And thus, we have uh, in Africa, especially in uh, along Kenya, Somalia border there, we find that there are challenges facing the refugees themselves in terms of uh, being uh, going back to their home country and also being taught to remain again in Kenya. And lastly, the role of participation of women and uh, persons' abilities in terms of security. It seems that uh, these are groups which have been forgotten and you find that uh, uh, they are the most vulnerable or they are the most marginalized in terms of uh, when insecurity takes place. Thank you. There are a number of questions. Uh, I tried to answer some of them. First, uh, international tribunals, what role for, for them to solve the, the problem? Uh, there is a role for international tribunals when we solve the problem first. Otherwise, the international tribunals have no access to the, the conflict zone. So first we have to pacify the, and solve the conflict and then uh, find the people who, who committed the crimes and uh, bring them to justice. International tribunals, they do not possess instruments to solve the international conflicts, but they have instruments to, to punish those who created this, this conflict. Uh, the problem of refugees, first we have to find the, 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 the definition of refugees and separate them from the definition of migrants. Majority of people who are traveling from country to country in Africa and from Africa to Europe are migrants, mostly illegal migrants. So to stop this uh, flow, first we have to settle the problems, the conflicts in uh, Syria and Libya. I don't see any volunteers right now to be engaged in solving the problem in Syria, neither in, in Libya. And then when we solve the problem, we can start uh, rebuilding some of these countries like Syria and uh, Libya and some countries located farther in, in, in Africa, helping them to uh, develop economy, to keep the people from migration. Uh, I know this is a, a, it's a, a simple answer, but it's difficult to implement this. We have about 10 minutes left, folks, so plenty of time for questions. Yes, sir? Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency, for your comprehensive uh, overviews. So obviously, as someone who is not born from this, whatever, the Western civilization, uh, within this social context, as a student of Crawford, I was extremely interested in, you know, uh, you, are give, you are delivering a speech in an education uh, venue here. So I wonder, what's your comment towards the next generation of the national security practitioners or, you know, who is wanting to join the field. Like, uh, from a historical perspective, uh, how do we properly contextualize the idea of the Western civilization, Western values into uh, the research, into the practice of national security? Thank you. Thank you, speaking sounds, sounds to me like a rather philo philosophical question. And uh, <laughs> for, the, for the diplomats, it's hard to answer. Maybe if they uh, invite, <coughs> invite me for the seminar of the, which will last a, at least a weekend, so we can find the, the answer <laughs> to some of these questions. But definitely, it's not for a practitioner right now to, to find the answer for this kind of a philosophical uh, deliberation. Sorry. Yes, sir, in the gray. Pavel Kowindziński, um, a postgraduate student, College of Asia in the Pacific. And um, thank you very much for, for your presentation. Um, you highlighted that Poland um, intends to focus on European Union in strengthening um, its uh, security policy. But um, what some of us could observe uh, in Polish foreign policy in Europe, it's something more close to um, self-isolation and um, increasing lack of credibility, um, as evidenced by the failed support for um, Donald Tusk in the last re-election. 
and also the um, problems with the um, arm, army um, equ equipment bit in France as also I'm um, cooled down relations with, with Germany and um, focus on UK, which suddenly um, left the European Union. So um, th isn't it threatening um, Polish uh, security um, uh, preferences and, and, uh, and, and interests now in Europe? And how would you relate um, what's happening on the political side and on the more security side of, of foreign policy of Poland now? Thank you. I understand that uh, the young man is far away from the homeland. It's uh, reading the uh, incorrect uh, newspapers and uh, news coming from, from Europe, maybe from, from Poland, because uh, uh, we are very intensively engaged in the international uh, diplomacy. Well, what I'm doing here? <laughs> am, I, am I isolated? Look at these people are standing around the corners, you know, because there are no uh, seats here. So uh, we do not feel isolated. A uh, few couple couple weeks ago, I was invited by Rex Tillerson uh, to, to to Washington D.C. to spend uh, some time with him discussing international issues. Also, some of those issues we just discussed in the moment before, like uh, North Korea. A week ago. Polish Prime Minister Beata Szydło was invited to Hanover Messe, one of the biggest industrial fair trade fair in, in Germany, and Poland was a, uh, was a guest of honor invited to participate in this uh, in this uh, uh, event. A um, few weeks ago, Polish Minister of Finance was invited to participate in a G20 meeting. So. How many evidence I supposed to num enumerate to tell you that Poland is not isolated, but is a major country in Europe which is taking part in the major decision of institutions we do belong to, means NATO and European Union. Up the back of being very patient. <clears throat> My name is Terry Henderson. You're looking for support for Poland to be a non-permanent member of the Security Council. Some people, or many people around the room, will recognize, be familiar with this because Australia was in the same position a few years ago. Now, from Australia's time on this, as a non-permanent member, can you see any lessons or examples for how a non-permanent Security Council member can be pr productively used the year or two that it is on the Security Council? Yes, I, uh, I understand you are. Uh, Mm -hmm. Referring to the, the notion that a non-permanent member has no right to uh, to decide because uh, everything which is decided by ten non-permanent non-permanent members of the Security Council can be vetoed by five permanent members. But uh, being for two years in the Security Council, even non-permanent member of the Security Council has a right to initiate number of discussions. So may through these discussions. Uh, reach to the international public and to create the climate for future s solution. Uh, and then, of, of course, everything depends on the skill of diplomacy. You remember tragic accidents which happened um, a year ago with a Malaysian uh, plane which was shot down by Russian and Russian rebels from Donbas. And due to the skills of your uh, excellent uh, uh, Minister of, of uh, Foreign Affairs, the whole security country, including Russia, condemned this accident, condemned this incident. So even non-parliament member of the Security Council, using the skills, the brains, uh, can use this instrument to, pro to, to make a progress, uh, uh, in progressing international law, or finding the important uh, information about some mysterious situation. We have time for about two more, three if we're lucky. Yes? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Minister, for coming to Australia. We do appreciate. Uh, we represent the Polish Chamber of Commerce Australia, and we are focused uh, purely on economic and bilateral cooperation between Poland and Australia. We would like to ask, I would like to ask about the future measures uh, from Polish government perspective about closing uh, a 
to making cooperation on the diplomatic level, economic level, of course, security level, much stronger between Poland and Australia. What are the specific measures on these three levels do you foresee in the near future, and maybe a little bit further future as well, please? Thank you. The first measure, measure is easy, easy, easy because uh, we need to expand our uh, presence. My predecessors were closing uh, uh, embassies, consulate, uh, and other uh, Polish institutions uh, abroad, about 40 of them, searching for uh, saving costs uh, and also closing activities. They were actually limiting uh, foreign policy of Poland, pulling out troops for peacekeeping operations and closing the embassies and consulates. We are trying to expand. We are trying to return to some other countries where embassies, Polish embassies, were closed. Uh, last year we returned to uh, Baghdad, to Senegal. This year we are uh, trying, we will open embassy in Tanzania, in Panama, in Filipinos. Next year, maybe in some other places. Mm -hmm. We will try to reopen, open new consulates because we have a, a growing number of Polish migrants living in the United Kingdom, United States. We will reopen the consulate in Belfast, in Northern Ireland this year, in Houston, Texas. Next year, most likely in Florida and Seattle, Washington. And uh, my colleague from uh, neighboring Ministry of, uh, of Development decided to, in the next few years to open 70 trade offices, 70 trade offices in different places around the world, hopefully also in Australia. So the first uh, answer is presence. Presence, and once again, presence. This will, the, will be the uh, recipe for the successful cooperation with the countries also like Australia. I think we do have time for two more. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Lisa from the Department of Border, um, Immigration and Border Protection. I was just wondering what your perspective on um, border-free travel and the implications for um, national Bo Border-free travel? Yeah, in the Schengen zone. Oh, Schengen, okay. Um, and the future of that travel in the context of ongoing security concerns. Well, I'll be brief because this is a very complicated discussion <laughs> right now. <laughs> Uh, where it started, of course, with uh, migrants uh, and refugees, which are trying to reach the uh, Greek and Italian and Maltese shores from North, Af North Africa and, uh, uh, and uh, the Middle East. Uh, it has to do with Brexit, because the uh, uh, United Kingdom decided not to respect one of the basic treaty freedoms, which is free movement of people. They, they are ready after Brexit to respect free movement of goods, capital, resources, and services, but not uh, uh, free movement of, of, of people. So these, these problems are together connected. How to protect Europe from one side, and on the other side, how to keep the openness of the, of the borders. So far, we do not have answers. We have more questions about this. For instance, what to do with those who are already on the territory of um, some islands, like uh, in Greece or, uh, or Italy? You probably know that uh, the idea of the Commission, European Commission, is to relocate them by quotas. We think in our part of Europe, Central Europe, this is a bad idea because relocation of quotas is an euphemism for resettlement by force. They don't want to go to, for instance, Poland. So why we have to sentence them to go to Poland? Why we have to, and how we are supposed to keep them in Poland if they want to live in Germany, for instance, or Sweden, Austria, with countries which, which have much higher developed uh, level of, of life. They are escaping from Africa, sorry to say, I'm, I have to sorry to say because I'm, I'm trying to develop my country and I'm proud of the level of development, but still is not as rich as the uh, neighboring, neighboring Germany. They are trying to uh, reach Europe, but the most advanced and uh, richest countries of, of Europe. So it's a complicated discussion right now how to protect Europe, 
how to protect uh, freedom of movement, and how to solve the problem of migrants. And a final question. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for your speech today. My name is Sab Khan. I am one of the international relations students here at the ANU. Uh, my question is in the context of um, Britain leaving the EU as well as US requesting um, its European NATO members to increase resources for the contribution of both financial and military for the contribution of NATO. Can we expect an emergence of uh, European Central Command and would Poland support such initiatives? That's another complicated issue, which uh, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not kidding. It's, it's a reality because we are discussing about the security of the continent, which uh, in the last uh, century survived uh, two major wars, uh, where dozens of millions of people were killed. A uh, continent which uh, went through the uh, trauma of uh, uh, of Nazi Germany, of Stalin's uh, Soviet Union, and things like that. So we need to protect our, of, uh, of ourselves, and we need to, to discuss seriously about that. In NATO, there is a concept that uh, each country is supposed to pay at least 2% of the GDP on the military budget. There are only, uh, of uh, 20 countries, there are only five uh, which are fulfilling these criteria. Poland is one of, one of them. The others complain that we're supposed to look right now uh, from the broader perspective on the security issues, not only concentrate of, on airplanes, tanks, uh, hardware, but also we're supposed to include to the security spending, for instance, international aid. Because if, if we spend money to help people in Mali, for instance, Senegal, Niger, or other countries, and they they are stay there and they are not migrating. It's also a kind of a security spending. So it's a big debate right now how we can protect Europe by direct military spending or using also soft power of the European Union to protect Europe by creating a safe and wealthy environment around, around Europe. Um,